be a neighbor, and win the neighborhood. Good morning. Good to see you this morning. This is a great looking nine o'clock crowd this morning. Every week, um, I just see new faces and faces I haven't seen in a while, and it just keeps getting better. Um, good to see you. Turn to somebody and smile really, really big this morning and say, it is good to see your beautiful smile. <laughs> Some of you said that like you really meant it, um, so that's good. Uh, hey, if you happen to be uh, a guest with us today for the first time, or, or maybe you're newer to, to uh, Neighborhood Church, um, hey, take a second if you would. We'd love for you to, to grab this connection card in the seat in front of you and fill that out, and, uh, and leave it at the, the welcome desk on your way out. We'd just like to give you a little gift, and, and thank you for being with us. Um, thanks for being with us today. I, I, we're, we're entering into the week of Thanksgiving, and... Um, I, I want to talk to you this morning about that very thing, being thankful, uh, living thankful, and gratitude, and having a heart of gratitude, and what that, what that actually means. One of the things I'm extremely thankful for this morning is our, our Buy a Tree, Change a Life lead team. Um, these guys are absolutely amazing and have already uh, uh, gotten us off to an incredible, incredible start uh, for this season's Buy a Tree, Change a Life. Hats off. Um, those guys are here in the service, some of them this morning anyway. Would you guys just stand? Sam, Craig, uh, who else is in the room this morning that's a part of that lead team? Um, Robert, stand up there. Michael and Anisha. Um, <clears throat> thank you guys. Um, from the bottom of my heart, thank you guys. Um, thank you to all of you who, who have volunteered already and will throughout the next couple of weeks. Big, huge thanks to all of our volunteers that have, that have already worked really, really hard. Um, nobody works harder than this lead team, man. They work tirelessly, um, almost around the clock um, throughout this project and even going back a few weeks before the project. So uh, couldn't do it without you and your hard work and dedication. Thank, thanks, guys, so much. Off to an incredible start. As Noah said, uh, $7,000 day yesterday when we really weren't even open. I mean, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, people uh, bought $500 uh, worth of ornaments yesterday. Just um, incredible stuff. And, and the stories um, will, will continue to come forward. Um, we, I met a couple of people yesterday who, just in conversation out on the lot, um, they said, hey, what time do your services start? And I told them, and they said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to visit tomorrow. So looking forward to meeting some new people from the community, and that happens every single year. Just, just one of the, the great things that happens through, through Buy a Tree, Change a Life. Um, so it's going to be an incredible, incredible year. We're heading into Thanksgiving week, um, one of my favorite times of the year. Uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas, Christmas being number one for me, um, but, but Thanksgiving's an incredible week as well. And um, as we head into this week, I, I can't help but to, to wonder and ask the question, you know, what, what would life be like if, if Thanksgiving was, wasn't just a holiday that we, you know, we tend to get the, the warm, fuzzy feelings around Thanksgiving, you know, in, in, on the inside when we think about uh, family and getting together with family and friends and having this big meal and, and all the traditions that we have that, that go with Thanksgiving, which, which I love um, and, and many of us love. But what, what if Thanksgiving w was more than just something that we, we, we kind of looked forward to and we focused on this one time a year on this specific day of the year? What if it was more of, of just how we lived our lives every single day? Um, you know, as, as followers of Jesus, I want to speak directly to, to those who are believers in the room this morning. Um, as followers of Jesus, we, we're called to be different. We're called to, be, to live our lives uh, with, filled with gratitude and thankfulness. We're, we're called to be set apart and different. So, so when you're thankful and when you're filled with gratitude for something, I believe that does make you different. That does make you a different person. Proverbs 15, 13 says that a glad heart makes a cheerful face. Have you ever read that? A glad heart makes a cheerful face. It says that, um, but by sorrow of heart, the spirit is crushed. So, so for some of us, you know, if, if you're looking for or maybe need a little bit of a makeover, um, all you really need to do is smile. 
I mean, just, just smile a little bit more. Um, just, just smile, and, 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 and things will begin to get a little bit better. It affects the heart, and, and vice versa. The, what's happening on the inside of the heart, the Bible says, effect, actually affects this face. and makes a, a cheerful face. Um, in preparing this week for, the, for this message, um, I came across an article um, on, on positivepsychology.com. I want to read to you some of the benefits that, that psychologists tell us come with gratitude. And it says this. It said this in the article. It said, number one, gratitude releases toxic emotions. Um, that could be good for some people. It says that gratitude reduces pain. Gratitude improves sleep quality. Gra- Amen, Noah. Come on, you need that one. Um, gratitude improves sleep quality. Gratitude aids in stress regulation. Gratitude redu- reduces anxiety and depression. And I threw in number six, gratitude is biblical. Gratitude is actually a spiritual thing, and that's what, that's what we're going we're gonna to find out this morning. It's actually a sign of spiritual maturity, and it's a sign that, that I have something to be grateful for. And it's not necessarily tied to my circumstances or anything that I have or don't have in this life. It's, it's directly attached to someone that I have in my life. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. And, and maybe you struggle this morning. I, I, I understand. Maybe you struggle this morning with, with finding anything in this life, maybe heading into Thanksgiving and the Christmas season, anything to really be thankful for. I understand that, that there may be somebody listening online this morning, somebody in the room today, that you struggle really digging deep and finding something to be feeling good about and thankful for and grateful for in your life. But I want to tell you this morning, I believe with all my heart that there is a new joy, there's a new hope, there's a new strength available for you this morning. That's a good place to say amen. 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 I want to share with you five quick stories from the Bible about five different people that, um, and, and, who were very thankful people and how, how why they were thankful affected what they did and how they lived their lives. Five very thankful people and how why they were thankful affected what they did and how they lived their lives. Most of you in the room are familiar this morning with with the story of of, of the the Samaritan woman. Uh, The Samaritan woman who uh, was so thankful that that, uh, why she was thankful led her to do certain things. And uh, the story kind of goes like this. I'll kind of paraphrase the story. Uh, Jesus, if you remember the context of the story, he, he had been ministering with his disciples, and he, he took a detour and went out of his way. And, and, and as you look at the whole story and read it in context, he intentionally went out of his way for this woman. Um, the Bible teaches us that, that Jesus, uh, the great shepherd, uh, was, was the one who would leave the 99 to go after the one that was lost. Um, I, heard, I heard a pastor say recently, um, coming out of this pandemic and, 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 and people slowly coming back to church, he said, I get it that, you know, gee, we're, we're supposed to leave the 99 to go after the one. He said, I know where the one is. I don't know where the 99 are because they're, they're not in my church. Um, so, um, you know, uh, uh, but, but, but Jesus went out of his way to, to meet this Samaritan woman, this woman at the well. Maybe you're familiar with that story. And he goes out of his way, and he meets this woman who, who is there to come and get water. And this woman had, like, had everything going against her already. She was, number one, she was a Samaritan. Number two, she was a woman in that day, which was difficult to be. And number three, she was a very immoral woman. And so in her time, literally, she would have been looked at by most of society as just trash, the lowest of the low. And so she's here at the well, and she, prop- she goes at a time, when, a time of day when nobody would be there, but Jesus, knowing she would be there, shows up. And um, while he's there, uh, he just starts to kind of st- starts up a conversation with this Samaritan woman. He starts up a conversation, and she's, she's probably totally in shock that, that he's even talking to her because he's a Jew. And Jewish people didn't associate with Samaritans at all during that day, especially with women, especially with a woman who was so immoral like she was. 
And so he starts up a conversation with this woman, and then as the conversation rolls on, he just starts, starts to try to, as only Jesus could do, read her mail. And he starts to, to point out the things that, that, that the, the, the sin and the, the, the lifestyle that she's living that's, that's just not good for her and it's not the best and he's got a better plan. And he begins to point those things out to her and he begins to talk to her about things like worship. And then he reveals to her, he tells her who he is. And he reveals to her that he's the Messiah. And as soon as she discovers that, that Jesus is the Messiah, she has this feeling something comes over her that he's telling her the truth. Um, she's shocked. She's completely shocked. And she runs back to her town, runs back to her village. And she says this. The Bible says that she said, it, it, it says, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And the Bible says that they came out of the town and they made their way towards him. And here's the deal. She was so filled with, with gratitude and awe and thankfulness and, 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 and mystique and wonder, filled with all this, not because Jesus told her what she had done, but because he knew everything that she had done. And she's in awe, and she's in awe because not only did he tell her everything she'd ever done, he told her that, look, you're not married, and the man you're with now is like the fifth or sixth man that you've been with, and you've not been married to any of them. And, and he, not only did he read her mail, but it wasn't that he told her what she did, but it was that he, he loved her when he told her what she did. It was that he, he extended to her grace and love and mercy, and he didn't condemn her when he spoke to her about what she did, but he extended the, the, the love and the grace and mercy that only Jesus had the ability to do. And she was grateful for this. She was thankful for this. And so the Bible says that because she was so grateful and so thankful for what she did, she went back to her town. She told other people, and the Bible says because of this woman, many Samaritans believed because of the impact that Jesus had on her. She just had to invite others to be a part of this. Many of you are here today because at some point in your, in your journey, some point in your life, somebody invited you to be a part of their walk with Jesus. Because somebody invited you, come and see. Come and meet the people of God. Come, and, come to my church with me. Hey, come, come, come meet, experience Jesus with me. Many of you are here because somebody did the same exact thing with you. Same exact thing with you. There's another in the story in the Bible of, of this blind guy who was blind, the Bible says, since birth. So, so think about this. As a little kid, all he saw was darkness. As a child, as a teenager, all he saw was darkness. As an adult, all he sees is darkness. And then all of a sudden, Jesus appears one day on his path. And, uh, and Jesus reaches down, gets some mud. This is where Jesus did the thing, you remember? He gets some mud, he spits on it, makes it into some, 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 some spittle. And he puts it on the, the blind guy's eyes, and he tells him to go wash in this pool. And when he comes up, he, he can see, and he's healed. And the blind guy just starts going through the streets pro proclaiming, Jesus has healed me. Jesus has healed me. And then as always, there's these swagger jackers that come along, these Pharisees, and want to rob him of his joy, rob him of anything good that God's done in his life. And they start to cast doubt and, and, and skepticism. And they start to say, oh, it's not real. This is a fraud. And that, that Jesus, he's a false prophet. He's a sinner. He couldn't do anything like that. And, and the blind guy, listen to what he says. The blind guy says, listen, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I know for sure, I was blind and now I can see. And listen, he's so filled with gratitude and thankfulness, because, not because of his circumstances. I mean, this guy was a poor pauper. He'd never seen his whole, his whole life. He wasn't thankful, filled with gratitude. because He was thankful because of Jesus, because of what Jesus had done for him, that he just had to tell him, Look, listen, you can say, you guys can sit over there and have your little debate, your little theological debate all you want, but all I know is Jesus healed me. Let me tell you what Jesus did for me. Listen, when your heart's full of gratitude, you can't help but to, to share your story with others and tell it to others. I don't know what that might look like for you today. 
Maybe, it's, maybe, it's, maybe God didn't heal you of, of actual, literal, physical blindness, but maybe it's, it's like, hey, you know what? I was lost. I was searching for something. I tried everything out, everything else in the world, and all of a sudden, somebody introduced me to Jesus, and he filled a void in my life that I can't even describe, but he has made all the difference in the world in my life, and I'm so thankful that somebody introduced me to Jesus. Maybe it's, you know what? I was bound. I was addicted to this. I had this stronghold in my life. I had, I had this kind of addiction, and, 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 and I tried Jesus, and I, and I got involved in the church, and the people of God, and, and the power of God, and the presence of God in my life helped me to overcome that addiction. Maybe it's, listen, I was in, I was in this bondage, and, and, and my, my wife, she used to have a cat, and all of a sudden, the cat disappeared, and, and now I've been, been set free. I don't know what it is in your life. But when we have true gratitude in our lives, we just can't help but to share it with other people. There's a woman in the Bible named Dorcas. Did you know that? There's a woman in the Bible named Dorcas. Bless her heart. Um, no, that's actually kind of a cool name. But here's what, let me tell you what the Bible says about a woman named Dorcas in the Bible. It says, in Joppa there was a disciple, a disciple, a woman named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. Acts 9, verse 36. This woman, Dorcas, if you, if you read the story, she had experienced the, the love and the grace and the provision of God in her life. And she was grateful for that. She was thankful for that. And, and, and the Bible just kind of lays out this story and shows us that this woman named Dorcas uh, God, God had just given her a burden, specifically a specific burden for widows in her community. And that was a big deal because widows in that day, uh, the way the law was set up and the customs were set up, when, when, when a woman's husband would die, all of his possessions, his home, his wealth, his, his money, his food, every, land, everything, everything went to the son. If there was not a son, it would go to his brother if he had a brother. And so there are all, all of these, wi these widows uh, living in, in these communities who literally ha had no means to provide for themselves, no, no way to make it. They were at the mercy of people, almost like, almost like beggars. And so God laid a burden on, on this woman, Dorcas' heart, to minister to the widows of her community. And so she would, she would do things like make clothes for them, and she would raise money to, to buy food for them. And because she cared enough because of the love that God had shown to her, because of the way that God had given himself to her, she said, I can't help but to give myself away to other people. And so she looked for ways to do that in her community, and God laid widows on her heart. And you know, the Bible says that there is no purer form of religion than to take care of the widow and the orphan. And if you read the scripture, the scripture actually tells us that this woman, her ministry was so important to God that when she died, God raised her from the dead, this woman Dorcas. And she had earned the right, she had earned the right to share the love of God with all of these widows and people in her community. You know why? Because she showed them that she cared, because she got involved in their lives, because she was so grateful for everything that God had done for her and for the way that God had sustained her and the way that God had continued to provide for her that she said, listen, God's given to me so much, I can't help but to give myself away to other people. She was filled with gratitude for what God had done in her life. There's another man named Peter in the Bible that we're, most of us are familiar with, and Peter was this ready, uh, ready fire aim kind of guy, you know, um, who, who would always, you know, leap before he looked kind of thing. And, and Peter, Peter in the Bible, um, he's probably most, most famous for uh, the couple of times that he just kind of blew it in, with Jesus. One, the first time was when Jesus is sitting down with his disciples and he tells them, I've got to go to Jerusalem um, to fulfill uh, the scriptures and be, and be killed. I've got to go to Jerusalem and die. And Peter says, nope, that ain't going to happen. Are you, that, that's not the plan. 
and, 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 and just kind of rebukes Jesus on his plan. And then the second thing is like, is like just hours later when Jesus is taken away with the, the Roman soldier, by the Roman soldiers, and Peter whips out his sword, if you remember, and he cuts the guy's ear off. And, and, and Peter was such a hothead. Listen, that, that sounds like he's some kind of, you know, Zorro kind of guy. Like, let me just nick your ear kind of thing. Listen, Peter was a, a, a roughneck fisherman. He was, he was swinging for the guy's head. He was trying to behead this guy. And I'm sure Jesus is thankful because he only had to heal an ear, you know, instead of a severed head. But, but, but Peter is this, this hot-headed kind of guy. And, and Peter, we see a little bit later in the scripture, after Jesus goes to the cross, is crucified, buried, and is raised from the dead, just days later, um, God, G- Jesus himself, calls Peter to build his church. Peter, who has failed God repeatedly, Peter, who has blown it so many times. Can anybody relate to that? Where you you feel like you you failed God, you've blown it so many times. Um, Peter, who has blown it so many times, Jesus turns around and trusts him, trusts him to preach the message on the day of Pentecost, in which the Bible says 3,000 people were saved that day. He went to Peter and said, Peter, Peter, your name is Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And he entrusted Peter with this great task to go out and, 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 and preach the gospel that many thousands of lives would be saved. And Peter is so grateful, he's so thankful that the, of the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth chances that God has given him that he's willing to go out and preach this message um, uninhibited so that many people could come to know Jesus. Friends don't let friends die without Jesus. And friends don't let friends live without Jesus. Man, sometimes I pray and I say, God, if, if I could just have the boldness of Peter, if, if I could have the, the boldness of Peter, you know, I think this is, this is an area where, where many times uh, as modern day Christians, we, we miss it. I, I, we miss it because of, of the way culture and society ha, ha, has, has moved and evolved, if you will. Um, I think many, many, many of us as believers, we've kind of been duped into believing that, you know, you got to be careful. You don't want to step on somebody's toes and and turn them away. Um, I always like to say, where are you going to turn them away to? Hell number two? If they're already lost, they're going to hell. What, What do you have to lose by telling them the truth and telling them, telling them the truth in love? I feel like this is where so many of us miss it. We feel like we've just got to be so careful. You know, I'll just let them watch me, how I live my life. And that's, that's part of it. You should live your life as an example. Um, but, but I don't think that's all we're supposed to do. I believe that God has called us to share the message. He called every single one of us to go and make disciples. That requires action, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That means we, we ask God to open our eyes and keep our eyes open and help us to be sensitive to his leading. When we see an opportunity, we're not afraid to speak boldly like Peter did and tell someone the truth and tell them the truth in love because we truly care about their soul. Grateful people want to share the message of Christ. The Apostle Paul said this. He said, though I am free and belong to no one, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. That's a powerful, powerful statement Though I'm free, and listen, I'm free, and I'm, I, I, nobody owns me. I don't owe anybody anything, but I choose to, to sacrifice my own comfort. I choose to sacrifice what feels good. I choose to sacrifice my life and become, he said, I become like, the, to the Jews, I become like the Jews. To the weak, I become like the weak. In other words, Paul says, whatever it takes, I will sacrifice who I am even, so that some may be saved. 
What a powerful statement by the Apostle Paul. And then the Apostle Paul, the last story I'll share with you this morning is the Apostle Paul writes, us, writes this to us from prison, sitting in a prison cell. The Apostle Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. While, while I'm sitting in prison, let me just tell you what we, what we should be. Rejoice in the Lord always. And he, just to emphasize it again, he says, and again, I say, rejoice. He said, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. Why, do you, why should you not be anxious about anything? Because the Lord is near. Because the Lord is near. You don't have to be anxious about anything, Paul said. Rejoice in everything because the Lord is near. He said, in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Listen, how can you be grateful? How can you be filled with thanks so that, so that, that your, your why uh, affects what you do and how you live? It all comes back to this word, thanksgiving. And listen, this week as we head into, into the, to the week of thanksgiving, Oh, everything, gratitude, being thankful, being filled with thanks and gratitude so that it affects the way we live our lives, it all comes down to that word, thanksgiving. That word thanksgiving in the Greek comes from the, the very word, the holiday, the name thanksgiving, to be filled with thanksgiving. It actually comes from the word eucharistia. And in the very center of that word, eucharistia, is the word charis, that means the grace of God. Thanksgiving, the holiday that we, that we celebrate, to be filled with thanksgiving the way that the scripture instructs us to be filled, it actually literally means to be thankful, yes, but it literally means to be thankful for the grace of God in your life. That's what it means. So to be filled with gratitude, to be, to be thankful, to live a different kind of life is not about what? It's not about what you have. It's not about what you don't have. It's not about circumstances even in your life. It's about who? It's about the grace of God in your life. To be filled with thanks, to be filled with gratitude means that I am focused in my life on Jesus. I am focused on the grace of God. That means it, do, it doesn't matter what circumstances look like. It doesn't matter what I have or, or don't have or even what's happening to me. Like Paul said, in all things, I can rejoice while, even while I'm sitting in a prison cell. What it means is in everything, I can be thankful because I'm focused on the grace of God who sent the only son that he had to give himself away for me. So why I'm thankful affects what I do and how I live my life. Because why I'm thankful isn't about what at all. It's about who. It's about Jesus. Is anybody in the room this morning, are you thankful for Jesus? Amen. Anybody thankful for Jesus this morning? Listen, if you know Jesus, there's peace. That scripture that Paul gave us he said the peace of God will guard your hearts in Christ Jesus the word peace actually means this it comes from a Greek word that means wholeness wholeness that word anxious in the same text actually means to be in part to be in, in pieces if you will which is why it makes sense when we say, I feel anxious. It's, it's like we're being pulled apart this direction and that direction and this direction. So that word peace and that word anxious in that, in that text that Paul gave us in that scripture, they're total opposite words, peace and, anx and anxiety. Peace and to be filled with peace and to, or to be anxious. They're total opposites. One means to be pulled in part, scatter, scatter, I, I, I'm falling apart essentially. To have the peace of God means I have the a sense of wholeness, completeness, confidence, settledness. It's the peace of God. It's the, 
the wholeness of God. I'm just content that everything's going to be okay. To know Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace, is to know peace. I'm so thankful for Jesus this morning. I'm going to ask everybody if you would to stand this morning. If you know Jesus this morning, you have everything to be thankful for. There's a chance that with this many people in the room and a lot of others watching online this morning, there's a chance that there may be somebody listening today that you don't know him. You don't know Jesus the way we've been talking about him this morning and referring to him. You don't know his peace. You don't know him in this sense. I want to, I want to pray a prayer this morning, and I just want to ask everybody to pray it with me. If you're here today and, and maybe you, you feel there's something missing in your life and you recognize today that, hey, it's probably Jesus. I'm missing that. I'm missing, my, I'm missing a Savior in my life who gave his life willingly to die for me, who hung on a cross and was crucified for me, who, 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 who was buried in a tomb and three days later, just like he said he would, rose from the dead. And I need to put my faith and my trust in Jesus this morning. I want to call him my Lord and Savior and trust him with my life. Is there anybody in the room this morning that you'd be bold enough and, and honest enough to say, you know what, that's me. I need to give Jesus my life today. Is there anybody? I want to take just a second because I want to, we want to pray together today. Is there anybody? Maybe you're watching from home today or somewhere else and, and that's you. I'm going to ask everybody to just pray this prayer out loud today with me. At home, pray this prayer today with us as well. Would everybody just pray and repeat after me? Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. And I'm so thankful for you. I'm thankful that you gave yourself away for me. That you died for me. I'm thankful that I've been forgiven of my sins. I'm thankful that you rose from the dead. I'm thankful that you're alive and well today. Fill me with your spirit that I might live for you. I commit my life to you today as my Lord and Savior to follow you, to pursue you, to serve you, to honor you with my life. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done. I now give my life to you. And it's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, I want to ask, um, I want to ask our team. I want to ask our team to join me up here on the stage today, our, our, our pastoral staff. Uh, if you guys would come on up, Ross, come out of the booth if you would. Zach and Abby. Um, would you guys just join me on stage for just a second? Actually, step on up here where we can see you. I just want to say publicly how thankful I am for uh, a group of some of the greatest people that I know uh, on this stage that serve us as a church and serve our staff. Um, I love them very much, and they love you very much. Uh, Pastor Amanda is out of town uh, at a wedding today, uh, this, this weekend, and she's just joined our team as well. And uh, we're just so thankful for the team that we have here. And um, I just want us to, to, to together pray a prayer of blessing um, over you and your families as we enter into this Thanksgiving season. Um, first of all, I, I want to I I give thanks for anybody who, who made a commitment to Jesus Christ today, watching from home or in this room, wherever. Um, so proud of you, so thankful for that. Can we just give them a hand this morning?
listen, listen. Um, you may have made that decision this morning and you may stand here this morning and just feel like, hey, I didn't feel anything magical that happened. You know, aren't we supposed to like cry or something? <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know, um, throughout scripture, um, the, the invitation that Jesus gave to people to become followers of his, you know, you know what that looked like in the Bible? He said, hey, come follow me. And they did. And they just followed him. And they began to learn his ways. And they begin to dedicate themselves to his ways and his teachings. And so that's what I invite you to do if you made that, that decision this morning is to, to get involved, to be a part of, uh, if you don't have a, a, a church family, um, let me just say welcome home, welcome to the family. Let this be your family. Let's get involved and follow Jesus and learn his ways together. Um, uh, proud of you, thankful for that. I want I want the team to just join me this morning in praying over you as, and your family as we head into Thanksgiving and head into Christmas. Christmas, we want this to be the greatest time of thanks and gratitude and, and dedicating our lives to Jesus that we've ever had this season. Um, so would you do this with me? Would you just stretch your hand this way? And we're just going to pray together and we're going to ask God's blessings. Father, we love you so much this morning. God, we, we are so thankful this morning. We are so grateful. We could never adequately express our thanks to you. God, I personally am so thankful for your love, your mercy, your forgiveness. The countless times, God, that you have given me another chance. The countless times that you have picked me up off the bottom. God, I thank you for that. Thank you for your gracious ways, the way you love us. God, I thank you for forgiving me of my sins. God, I thank you for, for your hand of leading me and guiding me through this life. And Father, I just pray over everyone hearing your voice this morning from home, in the room this morning. God, we pray your blessings over them this morning. God, as, as they pursue you this, this Thanksgiving and Christmas season like never before, God, I pray that you would pour out your blessings on their families like never before, God, that you would make your presence known to them in real and tangible ways, God. God, we just pray for a fresh encounter and a fresh presence in our lives. And God, we pray that you would just place in our heart an amplified, magnified portion of thanks and gratitude, God, that we might shine this, this, this Christmas and Thanksgiving season, that others would see you in us and find you through us. Father, we are grateful. We are thankful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, would you lift your voice one more time in gratitude and sing to him?
Has he been good to anybody else this morning? What an awesome Sunday morning. We're so grateful for you. We're praying you have an amazing Thanksgiving holiday with your family, with your friends. We love you. Come by a Christmas tree if you don't have one. If you have one, come hang out with us at the tree lot. We love you. Have a blessed week.